So thank you all so much for turning up and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about what inspires me as a scientist. And I've had the good fortune to be able to study these creatures that you are being handed out right now. So if all of you, do people know what we're looking at? They are mummified bats. And for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about why studying these creatures is very important for us to understand our health and for us to understand how life has evolved and how life works. And so, do people know much about bats here? Some of them are, but maybe some of them are not so blind, but we're going to touch on this. But bats are the most fantastic of all of our mammals. And one in five of every living mammal on this planet today is a bat. They're found throughout the entire globe. They are the only mammals that can actually fly by themselves, that have achieved true powered flight. So they're very, very unique. Perhaps a very unique thing that bats do is their type of sensory perception. So when do bats come out? They come out at night. Now imagine night. They're able to fly through these very, very complicated canopies and catch teeny tiny insects on the wing. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to get you guys to feel like what it's like to be a bat. And so here we have our beautiful insect Shaja. And what we're going to have you do is think about how bats can use sound to be able to perceive their environment. They listen for returning echoes. So what we want everybody to do is we want everyone to close your eyes. You're going to say the word Marco. Our lovely insect is going to say the word polo, and you're going to use your ears to work out where this insect is. Now we're going to do this three times, and on the third time, you're going to point. Open your eyes and point to where this is, and see, could you be a bat? So we'll start on the count of three. One, two, three. Marco! Polo! And again? Marco! Polo! And again? And point. All right, excellent bats. This is fantastic. So bats are able to use this unusual form of sensory perception to see their environment. But I'm a geneticist and a zoologist, and I really want to understand how could they do this? What is the genetic basis, the DNA that underlines this unique ability? And I'm very interested in all the different traits that bats can have. How can we understand how they can do this? Now, a way to do this is to look at their DNA code. And thankfully, the human genome has been sequenced. And what does it look like? Our fantastic, beautiful human genome. 13 billion US dollars to sequence at 3 billion base pairs that is in every single one of your cells that allows you to interact with your environment and be who you are. It allows the bat to be a bat. So let's look at this very wonderful code, the secret of all of life. So is this a male or a female? Anybody? Can you say no? Is this even a human? Can you say no? All right, well that's what your DNA code looks like. Modern medicine is moving to the fact that you can sequence your DNA code for as little as 45 US dollars in 15 minutes. And medicine wants to understand this. But how could you understand what it means? Is it good to be a G at this site or not? Well, one thing you could do is you can look at this same site in every different one of you. And well, we've gone and we have cooked this before, so please take it out. So we're going to look at this single site here, and here's a T. Now, can everybody in the audience hold up what they have? All right, and everybody look around. Now, what is the predominant code here? What do most of you have? Who has the A? How do you feel? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? All right. Now, the whole idea is every 300 base pairs of your DNA code, you're a little different. Is this difference good or is this difference bad? How can we work it out? So right now, you find everybody has a T and you have an A. Do you think you're special? Are you worried? Is it all right? Oh, what about T's? Are you happy to be T's? OK. Well, a way to actually try and understand this diversity is to look again to evolutionary history and to nature. And here we have, thankfully, what you need to do is you want to see, well, all right, evolution acts like a sieve. Things that are bad do not get tolerated over evolutionary time because you don't live long enough to be able to pass on that mutation to generation to generation. 
So the theory has it that parts of your DNA, parts of your genome that are important for your function have to be conserved over evolutionary time. So what you try and do is say, well, all right, let's go and look at evolutionary time. Let's go and look at animals that are closely related to us, animals that are very distantly related to us, and see if we can understand and work out what their DNA code is at that point. To give us an understanding of whether those positions are conserved, can they change over time? And if you find a site that is not free to change over time, this is a site that you should find disease mutations in. You can't change that site because it's going to make you sick. So thankfully, over the past 20 years, myself and my collaborators have made a tree of life. And we've worked out, when you look at an elephant, that's 100 million years removed from man. You look at a, oh, this way, excuse us. <laughs> You're tricking me. When you look at an elephant that's 100 million years removed from man. You look at a bat that's 80 million years removed from man. You look at a gorilla that's 10 million years removed from man. And here's man, that's recent time. And you look over evolutionary time. What you find is you find the site, most of these guys have a T at this site. And you all have a T at this site. This means that that site's not free to change. But you've got an A at that site. All right. But then you say, OK, let's go look at nature. Let's look at bats that we know can hear so well but perhaps not see so well and we find that this region of the genome is actually a gene to allow you see, a gene for your visual proteins and we find in bats that don't see so well, what do they have? Oh, they have an A. So what we find is that over evolutionary time everything has a T. Most of the human population has a T. Bats have an A, you've got an A, maybe you've got a predisposition to something scary. So this is how you can use population genetics and comparative genomics and deep time in nature's experiments to really understand how our genome works quite well. But if you guys look at the bats you still have in your hands, there's something I haven't told you about just yet. They're really unique, cool, cool thing. So bats are very unusual mammals because they're extremely small. We can put away our genome. They're extremely small but they can live for a ridiculously long time. Bats can live up to 10 times longer than expected. Now think about it in nature, there's a rule. Small things live fast, die young. Bats are really small things, but they can live for 10 times longer than expected. The oldest bat that was caught in the wild was at least 42 years of age. Think of mice, think of hamsters, they don't live so long. So what do bats do? And for 10 years I've been thinking, how are we going to work this out? How do bats have the secret of everlasting youth? Where can we look at in the bat to try and understand where the secret of everlasting youth might come from? <laughs> the blood is your life. The blood is your life. I give you eternal life. <laughs> you see, Bram Stoker was onto something. So instead of vampires taking our blood, we thought, well, all right. If you want to try and study how bats age, how do they not get diseases of old age? How come they're not getting cancer? They're not getting Alzheimer's. They're not getting diabetes. Diseases that children don't have, but as we age, we get them. What do they do to control this? We decided to go out in the wild because you can't keep these species in captivity. We go out in the wild, we take teeny tiny amounts of bat blood, we look at all of the genes and the proteins expressed in that blood, and we see what is it that they're doing to enable them not age as they should? We look at how can bats possibly achieve this wonderful health span. This is the research going on in my lab at the moment. So by doing this, we hope to understand how we can age better, more healthily. How can we control these horrendous diseases of old age? Because the secret is already out there in nature and it lies deep within the bat blood. So I want to say thank you very much for listening to me, listening about some of our batty ideas. And thank you very much to my research group and our resident Count Dracula.